Chapter 14, Discharge and Remedies, presented by Kelly Herzig. In this chapter, we're going to discuss methods of discharging or ending a contract. There are four types, discharge by performance, discharge by material breach, discharge by mutual agreement, or discharge by operation of law. We'll also discuss remedies. There are two types legal remedies, which are monetary damages, and equitable remedies. The first way to complete or end a contract is called discharge by performance. Usually parties discharge their obligations under a contract by performing the obligations under the term of the contract. This is called discharge by performance. The parties each perform their required duties under the contract and the contract ends naturally. Sometimes there can be a disagreement and one party will not allow the other party to perform. Parties can also discharge their obligations by making an offer to perform and being ready, willing, and able to perform. This is called tender, discharge by tender. Let me give you an example. Betty and ABC Painting agree that ABC will paint Betty's house for $5,000 by March 1st. If ABC shows up on time, ready, willing, and able to begin painting her house, but Betty refuses to let them start painting, ABC has discharged its duties under the contract by tendering performance. ABC can also sue Betty for material breach of the contract. Now there are two types of discharge by performance, complete performance and substantial performance. Complete performance is finishing all the duties under a contract perfectly. This is difficult to attain and most discharge by performance is actually substantial performance, which is also called substantial compliance. Substantial performance occurs when completion of nearly all the terms of the agreement, an honest effort to complete all the terms and no willful departure from the terms of the agreement. Basically, we're human beings and it's very difficult to attain perfection. A good example of substantial compliance is, is that if Betty has ABC paint her house tan with brown trim, but ABC paint the trim cream, this may be substantial compliance or substantial performance. However, the painter will either have to come back at his own cost to correct the error, or if Betty sues him in court, compensate Betty for having to hire another contractor to paint the trim the correct color. Sometimes performance of a contract is subject to the satisfaction of one of the contracting parties. This is not an ideal contract negotiating term. And in fact, I would never recommend a client to enter into a contract where the performance is contingent upon the 100% satisfaction of the other party. It's usually a recipe for disaster. But this means that one party is not discharged until the other party is satisfied by their performance. As you can imagine, if that is a subjective view, that would be very difficult to complete that contract. Satisfaction may either be judged under a subjective or objective standard, depending on the subject matter of the contract. For example, the creation of a dress would likely be judged based on a subjective standard, meaning that as long as the buyer is not satisfied and is acting in good faith, the contract is not discharged. It's hard to tell how long dissatisfaction is in good faith. And so that basically holds one contracting party basically hostage until the other party is satisfied. For mechanical or utility standards, these will be judged on an objective or reasonable standard. For example, the production of nails or screw hardware would be judged by an objective standard. Would a reasonable person be satisfied with the performance, with how these were manufactured? Sometimes contract discharge can be conditioned on the satisfaction of a third party. Now you do see this in construction contracts. For example, in large construction projects, there are often provisions that require the architect to sign off on the construction as in compliance with the plans and specs. This is to ensure that all the plans and specs are met and you can get substantial occupancy certificates and the like. The next way that a contract can be completed or ended is discharge by material breach of contract. 
A breach of contract occurs whenever a party fails to perform an obligation or term under the contract. If the breach is a minor breach, it may entitle the party to damages from the breaching party if there is harm resulting from the breach, but it does not relieve or discharge the non-breaching party from performing under the contract. A material breach of contract is an unjustifiable, substantial breach of a significant term or terms under the contract. You can see the difference between a general breach and a material breach. While there are several legal tests courts employ to determine if a breach is material, it is usually a breach that goes to the heart of the contract, making it irreparably broken and can defeat the purpose of making the contract in the first place. It has to be a big material deal to the contract. It is a failure of performance significant enough to give the non-breaching party the right to sue for breach of contract. If there is a material breach of contract, not only can the non reaching party sue for damages, their performance under the contract is also discharged. So if it's a minor breach, you may be able to get damages, but you still have to perform. But for a material breach of contract, not only can you get damages, but you are excused from performance. Let's uh, take a look at this as an example again. Let's go back to Betty and ABC Painting. Suppose Betty hires ABC Painting to paint her house for $5,000, but it must be completed by May 1st because she's having a huge family party the next day and she wants the house to look nice and freshly painted for the party. If ABC Painting fails to get the painting done by May 1st, that breach would likely be material under these facts. Betty would not have to let them start the painting late and her duties under the contract would be discharged. She could also sue for breach of contract. However, if the date were not key, in other words, there's no party, there's not an, a hard end date, the fact that ABC was a day late in completing the contract would still be a breach, but it would likely not be a breach considered a material breach, meaning Betty's obligations would not be discharged under the contract. She'd still have to pay for the painting. Next, we'll discuss anticipatory repudiation. Sometimes a contracting party may decide not to complete the contract before the actual time of performance, often due to changing market conditions. This is called anticipatory repudiation of the contract. The party breaching the contract can either expressly tell the non-breaching party of their intent not to perform, or impliedly convey their intent by taking an action that would be inconsistent with their ability to carry out performance when it comes due. Sometimes it just becomes too expensive to produce the widget, and so they don't do it. And they basically breach the contract and say, sue me. Once the contract has been anticipatorily repudiated, the non-breaching party's obligations under the contract are discharged, and he is free to sue for breach of contract. The non-breaching party can find another party to complete the contract, or he can decide to give the party who repudiated the contract in the first place another chance to change their mind and perform. Another way to complete a contract is called discharge by mutual agreement. Sometimes the parties just agree to discharge each other from their obligations. There are four major types of mutual discharge. The first is mutual rescission. Parties can simply agree to mutually discharge each other and cancel the contract. For example, the parties to a catering contract can agree to rescind that catering contract when the future event is canceled. Then there's substituted contract. Instead of rescinding a contract, the parties want to substitute a new agreement in place of the old one. The old contract is discharged and the new contract becomes the agreement between the parties. For example, if the parties agree to expand an order for products and increase the quantity, the new contract with the higher quantity becomes the contract between the parties, and the old contract with the lower quantity is discharged. Then there is accord and satisfaction. You may remember our previous lesson on accord and satisfaction concerning partial payment of a debt. But as a reminder, this occurs when one party wants to substitute a different performance for his original duty under the contract. The party's duty under the contract is not discharged until the substituted performance is completed. 
The final one is called Novation. This involves substituting a third party for one of the parties to the contract, as agreed to by all three parties. Once the third party is substituted, the original party is discharged, and the new party becomes obligated to the original party under the contract terms. For example, if an event becomes much larger, substituting one catering company for another larger one due to the increased size of the upcoming event can be done if all three parties agree to it. Next, we'll discuss discharge by operation of law. Sometimes a contract is discharged not by an agreement or action by the parties, but by operation of law. These include alteration of the contract. Materially altering a contract without the other party's consent discharges the contract. If a bank that holds a note and mortgage physically alters the documents to increase the interest rate from 5 to 10 percent without the other party's consent, that party's obligation under the contract is discharged due to the bank's material alteration of the contract documents. Then there's bankruptcy. A debtor in bankruptcy has their debts discharged. They are no longer legally obligated to pay those debts, and so the accompanying contracts are discharged. Tolling of the statute of limitations. Once the statute of limitations has expired, a party cannot sue the other party for breach, so it operates as an equivalency of discharge. In Kansas, breach of contract has a five-year statute of limitations. It runs from the date of the breach, so once the five years passes, the party can no longer sue for breach, effectively discharging the other party's obligations under the contract. Then there's impossibility of performance. This occurs when an unforeseen event happens that makes it physically impossible to perform the contract. It must be objectively impossible to perform rather than subjectively impossible, which would be just very difficult. Suppose a vacation house is under contract and in escrow waiting to close. During that time, a hurricane occurs and levels the house. It is now physically impossible for the seller to convey the house to the buyer because the house doesn't exist anymore. This is impossibility of performance and it can discharge the sales contract. Then there's commercial impracticability. This occurs when the contract would be objectively possible, but would be extraordinarily harmful or expensive for one party. Suppose Larry is awarded a contract to remove gravel from a certain area in preparation for a new city building. When the contract was bid, the area was completely dry. Now, however, due to a broken pipe at the site, the area is underwater and the gravel removal will cost 10 times Larry's original estimate. Larry can cite commercial impracticability as a basis to discharge the original contract. Then there's frustration of purpose. This occurs when factors beyond the control or foreseeability of the parties frustrate the purpose of the contract and neither party assume the risk of the event's non-occurrence, then the contract can be discharged. Suppose Larry is buying a building to lease to a third party. However, while the transaction is pending, the city condemns the property for building code violations, and that is unforeseeable by either party. Larry can rescind the contract with no obligation. Now that we've completed the area of discharge, completion of the contract, we will now talk about remedies for breach of contract. Many factors can go into the decision to sue on a breach of contract, such as the cost of litigation, maintaining ongoing business relationships, alternative dispute resolution options, and the likelihood of success. If a party does decide to sue for breach, there are two main types of remedies. Legal remedies are generally money damages. Equitable remedies are court-ordered actions such as specific performance. You may notice that there are both legal and equitable remedies available. As we've discussed before, courts sit in both law and equity, and so in breach of contract you have both equitable and legal options. First we'll discuss legal remedies, which are much more common. 
In law, remedies are designed to compensate those harmed by breach of contract for any losses they might suffer that are reasonably foreseeable as a result of the breach. Courts generally award monetary damages over equitable damages, except in specific narrow instances because equitable remedies are not preferred under the law. The types of damages available for breach of contract are compensatory damages, consequential damages, punitive damages, nominal damages, and liquidated damages. We'll discuss each of these legal remedies in turn. First, we'll examine compensatory damages. Compensatory damages are by far the largest category of damages available for breach of contract. They're intended to make the non-breaching party whole with the goal of putting that party in the same position as if the contract had been performed without the breach. These damages compensate the plaintiff for his or her loss of the benefit of the bargain made in the contract. That's why they're called compensatory damages. Compensatory damages must be damages that are foreseeable as a result of the breach of contract as determined from the time the contract was entered into. Foreseeability is not looked at at the time of the breach, but rather what was foreseeable at the time the parties entered into the contract itself. A plaintiff can be compensated for both expectation damages and incidental damages. Expectation damages are those that the plaintiff expected to gain as a result of the contract. Incidental damages are other losses incurred directly as a result of the breach. I've created an example of compensatory damages so that you can understand what compensatory damages are and how they're awarded. Larry hires Betty as his exclusive sports agent for six months at $10,000 per month. Betty is to represent Larry in negotiations for endorsements and his new basketball contract. Under the written contract, Betty can only be fired for cause, meaning that Betty can only be fired for poor performance. After one month, Larry fires Betty without cause. Though actively looking, Betty cannot find a job for two months and for the last three months of the original term, gets a job for only $5,000 per month. She has job search expenses of $1,000. Betty sues for breach of contract. Betty can recover the following compensatory damages. For the two months she was not able to find work, she can recover $20,000 which is two months times $10,000. That would have been the benefit of her bargain under the original contract. For the three months when she was employed, she can recover the difference between what she would have earned and what she actually earned, or $15,000. That's three months times 5,000. And as long as her job search expenses are reasonable, she can recover the $1,000 she spent as incidental damages. So her total compensatory damages would be $36,000. That's the benefit of her bargain with Larry. Some types of contracts have special rules for determining compensatory damages. The first is contracts for sale of goods under the UCC. Under the UCC, if the seller breaches, compensatory damages are calculated as the difference between the contract value of the goods and the fair market value of the goods as of the date of the breach, the day the goods were to be delivered, plus any incidental damages. If the buyer breaches under UCC contracts, they are calculated as the contract sales price minus any resale price the seller is able to get, plus incidental damages for the resale. If the buyer breaches before the goods are manufactured, the damages are the lost profit expected. The seller doesn't have to manufacture the goods and then try to sell them. If the goods are specialty goods and not capable of resale, like monogram shirts, the damages are the contract price for the goods. If the seller can't offload them because they're specialty goods and you breach as a buyer, you have to pay for those goods anyway. There are also special rules for construction contracts. In construction contracts, the compensatory damages depend on what stage the project is at when the breach occurs. If the owner breaches the contract, if the contract for a building project is breached by the owner before the project has begun, 
the damages the contractor suffers is his lost profit on the contract. If the contractor has already purchased materials and hired labor, the contractor can recover lost profits plus the value of the materials and labor if the owner breaches the contract. If the breach by the owner occurs after the project is completed, the damages are the contract price plus interest from the date the payment on the contract was due. If the contractor breaches before or during construction, the owner's damages are usually calculated based on the costs of hiring a new contractor plus incidental costs for the new hire and any delays to the project. If a contractor finishes late, the damages are the loss of the use of a building. Next, we're going to discuss consequential damages. Damages for breach of contract generally must be proven with a high degree of certainty. Though, of course, in breach of contract cases, the burden for the plaintiff is still the overall civil standard of preponderance of the evidence. Consequential or special damages are much harder to prove in breach of contract cases, but they are recoverable generally in tort. Consequential damages are damages that are foreseeable but arise from special circumstances or facts outside the contract itself. These damages would not necessarily be incurred by every party experiencing the same breach. So foreseeability is found where loss follows a breach in the ordinary course of business or as a result of special circumstances the breaching party has reason to know. There is a classic case in your book called Hadley versus Baxendale from 1854. It dealt with the failure to deliver a crankshaft for a mill on time. Baxendale came to stand for the proposition that consequential damages are recoverable where a contract is breached by a party that knows or is imputed or has reason to know that ordinary direct compensatory damages will not suffice to meet the damages caused by the breach. But you have to know or have reason to know of those damages at the time the contract is made. These damages must be within the contemplation of the parties at the time the contract was made. Your book says at the time the contract was breached, but the majority rule and the restatement says at the time the contract was made. Consequential damages can include lost profit, lost product, lost revenue, lost business reputation, lost goodwill, and even sometimes third party claims, though this list is certainly not exhaustive. Consequential damages and how they're proven bedevil courts even today. Determining what's a direct damage and what's a consequential damage is sometimes tricky. A lot of people also have trouble with the difference between incidental and consequential damages. The difference between incidental and consequential damages is the cause of the expense or loss. Incidental damages, which we just discussed, are the direct result of one party's breach of contract. Consequential damages are more indirect, being incurred not a as a result of the breach itself, but the end result of the breach. For example, the cost to complete a factory building that was finished late may be a small amount compared to the lost revenue or lost profit that the owner suffers because the factory is not operational on time. Because that is such a big risk, a lot of times commercial contracts have limitation of liability clauses or consequential damage waivers. These clauses purport to cut off the liability of parties for any consequential damages resulting from a breach of contract. In commercial settings, these clauses are generally enforceable between commercial contracting parties. Another legal remedy is punitive damages. We've already talked about punitive damages in tort, and just as in tort law, Punitive damages are designed to punish the defendant and deter him and others who learn of the award from engaging in similar conduct in the future. In breach of contract cases, punitive damages are rarely awarded because the primary goal of breach of contract damages is to compensate the injured party for the loss of his bargain. Most jurisdictions only award punitive damages in contract cases when the defendant has engaged in reprehensible conduct such as fraud. Kansas is in the majority on punitive damages. 
In Kansas, a plaintiff cannot recover punitive damages for breach of contract unless the defendant committed an independent tort. The plaintiff has to prove not only the elements of the breach of contract claim, but to recover punitive damages, the plaintiff must prove all the elements of the individual tort, such as fraud. Otherwise, the plaintiff can only recover his pecuniary losses sustained. We'll end our discussion on legal remedies with nominal and liquidated damages. We've discussed nominal damages before in torts, but nominal damages for breach of contract are awarded when the plaintiff does not have much in the way of provable damages. Only a small amount, but there was a breach of contract. A lot of times the court will award nominal damages. Liquidated damages are damage that are specified in the contract between the parties before any breach occurs. Liquidated damages clauses and contracts are usually agreed to because the actual direct damages may be difficult to determine in the event of a breach. An example is in construction contracts, direct economic loss for delay and completion may be hard to quantify. So the parties agree that delay damages are set at $1,000 per day for each day the project is late. Courts generally enforce liquidated damages clauses as long as the clause appears to be reasonably related to what the actual costs might be. Liquidated damages have to bear a reasonable relationship to foreseeable costs. If the clause has an unreasonable amount specified as liquidated damages, courts will deem the amount a penalty and it will not be enforced. Before we move on to equitable remedies, I want to discuss mitigation of damages. In breach of contract cases, the plaintiff has a duty to mitigate his damages. He cannot intentionally increase his damages by failing to mitigate. A plaintiff must try to minimize the losses from the breach of contract by the other party. For example, if a seller refuses to deliver goods, the buyer has to try to obtain replacement goods. Or if the buyer refuses to buy the goods, the, sell, the seller has to sell the goods a buyer refuses to buy. Or if you're fired, like Betty, the agent, find alternative employment. However, the plaintiff's mitigation must be reasonable in the circumstances, and the plaintiff is not expected to settle for less than what was contemplated under the contract in order to mitigate damages. Let's go back to our compensatory damages example. In that case, the wrongfully fired agent, Betty, mitigated her damages by getting replacement employment, though the salary was not as high, so she could recover the difference between what she would have earned but for the breach and her replacement employment. Now that we've discussed the legal remedies available in breach of contract cases, let's turn to what the equitable remedies are. To recover equitable remedies for breach of contract, a plaintiff must prove that no adequate legal remedy is available, irreparable harm to the plaintiff may result if the equitable remedy is not granted, the contract is legally valid, except when seeking relief under quasi-contract where there's no contract. The contract terms are clear and unambiguous, and the plaintiff has clean hands, meaning the plaintiff is innocent and has not been deceitful or breached the contract himself. The most common equitable remedies are rescission and restitution, specific performance, injunctions, and reformation of contract. And of course, recovery based on quasi-contract is also available. Let's begin with rescission and restitution. Sometimes parties simply want out of the contract and to be returned to the same position as they were in before entering into the contract. The contract is then rescinded or avoided, and any property given or money paid is returned to the non-breaching party, which is known as restitution. When a contract is voidable due to lack of genuine assent, parties are often seeking to avoid or rescind the contract and obtain restitution. For example, when a miner who buys a car as a miner decides to avoid the contract when they reach their majority, they have to return the car to the seller and the seller has to return their money to them. That's called restitution. They're basically seeking to rescind the contract and obtain restitution to put themselves in the same position as if the contract had not occurred. Then there is specific performance. This is an order from the court to one party to fulfill the terms of the contract as written. Specific performance is not favored in the law and courts would much rather reward compensatory damages. They're much more comfortable 
ordering money damages than ordering someone to specifically fulfill the terms of a contract. Specific performance is only available when monetary damages are not adequate, usually because the subject or purpose of the contract is unique, such as a piece of real estate or an antique item. Those are the two main areas where you will often see specific performance because every piece of land is deemed unique and antiques are often unique. The next equitable remedy we'll discuss are injunctions. Injunctions are court orders that order a party to do something or prohibit a party from doing something. They usually control the actions of a party. There are temporary, preliminary, and permanent injunctions. Temporary injunctions, temporary restraining orders, or TROs, are short-term injunctions and can be granted without notice to the opposing party and without a hearing. They are emergency orders that must then be replaced with a preliminary injunction that requires both notice and a hearing. You'll see these in stalking cases or child protection cases a lot. You don't usually see these in contract cases unless someone is actively dumping pollution into a waterway. Preliminary injunctions can be granted by the court to prevent a party from taking any action during the course of a lawsuit to protect the relative positions of the parties. The question is, without the preliminary injunction, would irreparable harm happen to one party during the lawsuit? As a part of the hearing, the party seeking a preliminary injunction must usually show a likelihood of success on the merits. It's not always easy to get a preliminary injunction out of a court. Permanent injunctions can be entered by the court as part of the remedies at the end of the case when monetary damages will not remedy a situation. For example, a court may issue an injunction against a company that is illegally dumping chemicals into a public waterway, prohibiting them from further dumping. The next equitable remedy available is reformation. Sometimes the written contract does not reflect the party's actual agreement, or there may be inconsistencies in the contract such that the court can reform or rewrite the contract to match the actual agreement of the parties. An example of a contract problem that would justify reformation would be a real estate contract where the price in numbers does not match the written amount, $10,000 in writing but $100,000 in numbers. This would force the court to rewrite the contract to put in the correct price. Another common reformation issue is survey information. In a real estate contract, the survey information may not match the address or platting information, and this requires reformation to make sure that the real estate is properly identified. We'll end our discussion on equitable remedies on recovery based on quasi-contract. When an enforceable contract does not exist, the court may still impose a contract-like remedy on one party due to the party's detrimental reliance on what he or she thought was a valid contract. We've discussed quasi-contract before, but let me remind you of the elements that a party must prove. The plaintiff must have conferred a benefit on the defendant. The plaintiff reasonably expected to be compensated for the benefit conferred on the defendant, and the defendant would be unjustly enriched from receiving the benefit without compensating the party for it. Remember the painting example in Chapter 9 when quasi contracts were initially discussed? This was the one where Larry knew the painter was painting his house in error, but let the painter work until he was done with the work, only to refuse to pay because he didn't hire the painter. In a lawsuit, the painter is going to be able to recover the fair value of the painting work on quasi-contract because Larry sought to take advantage of the painter's mistake and get his house painted for free. Remember that the key is that the enrichment must be unjust. The courts will not require parties to pay for the mistakes of others, but you cannot take advantage of the mistake knowingly to gain a benefit for yourself. That's unjust enrichment. This is the end of chapter 14.